The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 661, for Sunday, June 11th, 2017. (laughs) Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab show where you send in your tips, questions, and cool stuff found. We share your tips and cool stuff found. We answer your questions. And the goal is, of course, for all of us to learn at least four new things. Count them. One, two, three, and four. You should keep count for yours at home because that's what we do. Sponsors for this episode include Barebones Software at barebones.com. And then, of course, all of our great WWDC coverage sponsors uh, here and at TMO for this past week. And that's Riedel, SaneBox, Otherworld Computing, iMazing with iMazing Mini, and GigSky. So check all those out too. Here, back here from San Jose in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, hanging out with the boys of summer and girls, <laughs> um, this is John F. Braun. You, you and Mr. Henley hanging out? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's warming up here now. We, uh, we got out of our, uh, as you probably did, we snapped out of our uh, dreary, rainy, yucky. Yeah, I brought, well, it's really that I brought the San Jose weather back with me is what I did, John. Because yeah. they got rain right after I left and, eh, you know, it's, it suddenly became like 80 plus here. Well, so. that's good. So clearly, you know the way to and from to San and Jose. from there's a round trip in there somewhere yeah although yeah flights to san jose man it it's um it's i i really liked having and we'll talk about the announcements and, and some of the related stuff later in the show but um in general i really liked having a, a show in in san jose it's a great little downtown area it's kind of a weird downtown because it, like without having a conference there, I don't know how all of these like hotels and stuff stay in business. It doesn't feel like a destination otherwise. But because of that, it actually, in a sense, it sort of reminded me sort of of Ontario, uh, California, where where there's literally nothing um, except like a, a convention center and and some uh, and some hotels. But that meant that. The anywhere you went, you ran into people from WWDC, whereas when it was in San Francisco, uh, you, you know, yeah. things were so I mean, it's a, it's a major city, you, you know, so it, um, it, there, there were many other things going on, of course, in San Francisco with with San Jose. It felt like the, you know, whatever, 6000 people that were there for WWDC and then another probably three or four thousand on top of that for uh, just the, you know, just to be in town for alt conf and layers mm-hmm. and things like that. So uh, so I really liked the vibe of San Jose. The, the one major problem is that um, flights to San Jose, especially from from the East Coast, are limited. So I I was able to fly into San Jose on Sunday. It cost me a fortune to do it. But um, but I took a JetBlue flight that past Sunday night and and flew in for that. But flying out i had a uh I, I, the only way i could do it was to fly out of san francisco and so that meant i had a 6 30 nice. yeah but i had a 6 30 a.m flight from san francisco so that meant an hour-long uber ride to get there and i left my hotel at like 4 a.m but you know whatever it's fine it got me back on east coast time right away so there you go yeah i was there once years ago for an rsa conference and the okay. same reflection there's certainly it's certainly not the same venue in that there's limited things that I was able to find to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really a problem in San Francisco, but uh, yeah, but you're back. I'm and, back. Uh, yeah. So let's, uh, let's dive into the, the, the show. And then, and then once we get our, our footing here, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, all the events of, of Apple and such this week. But uh, well, let's start with Rico because Rico has a quick tip for us. Rico says, I learned something new while listening to uh, Federico Vitici's Canvas podcast. He says, you can drag and drop icons in the share sheet in iOS by simply tapping and holding them. I thought it was only via the menu that you had to scroll all the way to on the right to reorder. But you can reorder things in the share sheet just by tapping and dragging, uh, which is or tapping and holding and dragging. Pretty good tip. 
I had no idea about that. That's the there you go. One check. Ding ding. The share sheet. What what what's the what is the share sheet? I think pretty much everybody knows uh, what the share sheet is. But uh, when you go in uh, in iOS and you hit the little share button, which is the box with the up arrow, uh, that's the share sheet. So there you go. Ah, okay. Arrange things there. Thanks for the reminder. You bet, man. I knew that. I'm just okay. Just to help people. Please. I'm pretty sure that people listening know. We can assume our listeners are smart. But but actually, I'd be curious. Like it, I I. When we do this show, I, I try to balance the uh, the geeky stuff because we want to get into the stuff that's that's geeky and interesting to to the the geeks and, and stuff. And but I I also don't want to lose too many people at the you know, at either end, frankly. So is that too pedantic for us to explain what the share sheet is? I mean, I feel like I feel like it is, but I I, I could be wrong. So let us know. Feedback oh, at MacGeekab.com. You know, I think you said feedback at MacGeekab.com. Feedback at MacGeekab.com. That is correct. All right. Patrick with a cool stuff found. Patrick says, uh, a few shows ago, someone was looking to replace one key press with another. You have a solution uh, that was built into Mac OS with, uh, with keyboard shortcuts. But I wanted to point out Carabiner Elements. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes, of course, he says this started out as a focused utility doing one or two things, but now it is extremely powerful. Uh, he says, I've been using a variety. I've been using variants of this for years to change the option key into an enter key on a MacBook Pro. And uh, and it has now been moved to the Sierra compatible version has been moved to a GitHub repo. But um, but there you go. So. Uh, so there you go. That's it. That's it. Uh, cool stuff. Found. Check. Right? Carabiner Sh elements. Yes, sure. sir. Okay. All right. Uh, getting the tips out of the way. Time to take us to Andrew, John? Certainly. So, Andrew, who maybe we'll see later this week. I wonder if Caliban thinks about Manhattan or not. Um, Andrew first says that we rock and no Andrew you rock well we all rock except for that one person they, they kind of uh, you know still got to work on it but yeah um, I learned so much each episode I have a quick tip and a question a friend recently showed me that I could save quite a bit of info about my Mac under the black under the Apple menu about this Mac then click on system report towards the bottom of that page and then choose file save and a SPX Dot SPX file will be created with all the info listed, which I believe can be opened on most Macs. Yes. Um, and I think you can also export it as a uh, uh, just a plain text file. Um, and it's an exhaustive list of everything that your Mac can do and things that are installed on your Mac applications. It's, it's, it's really good. Um, but it can be helpful in selling the computer, I, I would agree. Um, that'll help person understand the capabilities, especially if you've customized it. Or when having it serviced, yes. So uh, <clears throat> create one of those every now and then, just uh, just for your own sanity. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, I like that. I mean, it may help you determine if something's malfunctioning because you can look at an old report and see, oh, hey, that's it's not there anymore. Or that changed. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's interesting, right? I mean, it's like it's like getting your you know your lab results every couple of years from your doctor. You just you know you get a baseline and go from there. Huh. I wonder if hmm. I wonder if there's a way if you could take two and compare and them. And compare them. The Delta. Yeah, you may have to. I think it's just an XML or text file. If so. it's just an XML file, something like uh, BB Edit from, uh, from actually today's uh, episode sponsor from Bare Bones would do that. So, Yes. Yeah. And second, here's my question. So that's a tip. Good tip. Here's my question. Do you have any suggestions for a reliable way to get USB 3 external devices to run at USB 3 speeds on a Mac Pro mid 2010. The computer only has USB 2 ports and no Thunderbolt ports, though it has four FireWire 800 ports. There are a few PCI slots available, and I've seen USB 3 cards on sale for about 30 bucks that seem to be reliable, but also read different issues with them. And he points to one here from Inatech. Okay. Um, and the only thing that they have, so it's in the comments for this card, so I've never heard of Inatech. Um, the, the problem, it would seem, with this card 
and that somebody posed the question and I guess they answered it or someone else did, is that when your machine goes to sleep, this does not handle that properly. And so it ejects, it, it improperly ejects the drives. Um, and that's bad. Oh, um, yeah. I can see. Yeah, so they're, yeah, they're, they're right. not Without doing something right with power management or something there. Um, fortunately, though, um, at least on Amazon, they recommend, or a, a lot of times when you find a, uh, any sort of product, they'll give you a little grid showing you some competing products uh, along with the features and the different price points. And looking, uh, it would appear that Sonnet, um, who I've heard of and you've heard of. Oh, and, yeah, they've been uh, around been forever. Doing, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, they actually had the same question posed in their Q&A, and they do not do that. The thing is, it, it's a little extra coin for that card. So I think it's under $100, but it's oh, not okay. $30. So, uh, so yeah, but then I think he uh, I think he got back and decided it's probably not worth doing that. And uh, based on some of the things uh, announced at WWDC, you may want to go for the new Shiny. Well, I think that's what I think that's what he's going to do rather than... Mm. Uh, trying to maintain this uh which i believe is an obsolete machine now right 2010 yeah or or yeah they've got or a name vintage. for those. i mean it's a vintage, good run thank but you. um yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah it's a good run um and i know that uh, uh andrew does pro work and actually needs that capability he he does uh, all sorts of photography uh, related things yep so yeah when you're choosing expansion for max that even offer that <laughs> But pretty um, cool. I mean, you know, you know, for the people that are interested or the, for, the, for the people that don't understand why some folks really like a Mac that's expandable like this. This is the reason right here. We've got this seven year old Mac that with the right PCI card, because it has this industry standard, you know, slot uh, architecture, you can plug something in and boom, you're good to go. The, the beauty though, is that Thunderbolt and, and I mean all of them, Thunderbolt one, two, and three offer this type of expandability without needing PCI slots. I mean, there's a, there's, there is some latency issues um, with Thunderbolt compared as compared to PCI stuff. Um, and, and that actually with like the new external GPUs, I was talking to some folks from, um, well, I don't, I don't know what company they work for, but, um, they were telling me that, uh, the, like the new external GPUs, things were great. If, uh, if you lo offload everything to the GPU and just send commands to it, like, like games are generally pretty good because they load all their textures and everything onto the GPU. And then they're just sending commands to switch. Right. So the latency on that's not not so bad but if you've got something that's that ex that's expecting an on bus uh gpu it that latency starts to be a problem but with usb that's not the latency is not an issue it's really only an issue when you're dealing with with stuff like this but thunderbolt is that uh, other than that uh it really is that expansion bus for for modern computers and it and it allows you to do these these types of things where your computer didn't come with this capability so it's like all right just basically plug this into the motherboard and you're good to go so yeah, yeah. and they had the same thing uh which i i think you now have it the uh my old uh, macbook pro 2008 i believe it was had a uh i think it was a card bus they called it right Very right similar it was yeah. an expansion yeah interface or expansion bus for uh you know allow you to enhance that machine and i think I did have a USB, a faster USB card at one point. So, right, and, and that's right. it's true. Yeah, it was it was before the. Um, uh, it's somebody in the chat room at macgeekup.com slash stream js billsboro notes that um, Craig Federighi talked about that on Gruber's talk show on Tuesday night, which uh, which I actually I, I had the opportunity to attend and it was quite fun, but um, I'd forgotten that Federighi talked about that publicly. But yeah, it's um, that's kind of how that works. So there you go. Thank you for that reminder. Hair. Yeah. The other guy with the hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was an interesting, um, watching the talk show was, was interesting to see the dynamic again between Schiller and Federighi. Uh, it always feels to me, or it felt to me last year and it felt again this year that, uh, that Schiller was there to be the PR person managing Federighi 
uh, for mm-hmm. the most part. I mean, Schiller had his own, he certainly had his own personality and, and comments and added some things to the conversation, but it seemed like for the most part, he's there to make sure Craig doesn't say anything that he's not supposed to. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but Schiller, like, you know, it, there was one moment where uh, Gruber said something about the keynotes early on in, in the talk show. He said, Hey, you know, that keynote yesterday on Monday would have been a great keynote at any Macworld Expo. And Schiller, man, ever the one to, like you, you forget because he's so affable and he seems like, you know, that that fun uncle or whatever, or maybe the grumpy uncle. I don't know. But um, but he just seems like just a jovial sort of happy go lucky guy. You forget how ruthless that guy is. And and like he holds a grudge forever because when when Gruber said that, he said, well, I don't know about Macworld, but maybe Apple Expo Paris. It's like, you know, you could have just let it go, Phil. <laughs> like, the, like, where is your axe to grind, man? I, you you already killed off Macworld Expo by don't, by not attending. Like, what's don't, the don't don't poke the bear. Don't. Yeah. Why are you turning the, the don't twist the knife, man? It's it's like already. Yeah. Anyway, it was really interesting to see that. It's like, oh, lest we forget, Phil is if Phil is and always has been quite, quite ruthless. But anyway, so, yeah, fun stuff. Good stuff. OK. OK. More hardware adventures or is it software? Let's find out. Take us there, man. <clears throat> so Michael says. All right. As a lesson to others. Go away. Um, hey, I got a tip for you then. But we'll, we'll, here's here's the tip. And then uh, and then we can go into Michael. So if you're doing something like, say, podcasting and you don't want uh, notifications to bother you on your Mac, you can go up to the upper right, which is the to the right of the, the very upper right. Top right corner of the menu bar is the little hamburger menu or whatever you call it for notifications. And you can click that and see them. Well, if you scroll that up past where it starts, which it feels a little weird, you can turn on do not disturb and that will turn it on for 24 hours. But there's a faster way to do it. Hold down the option key and just click that menu and you'll see it goes from light to dark. Now all your notifications are suppressed for 24 hours. You can, of course, option click it to bring it back. But if you forget, it will turn them back on in 24 hours. So there you go. Well, this is a different one. So this was actually a hardware growler notification. So, so that I'm doesn't do use right notification now. center? It should. I'm pretty it sure it does. It uses its uh, I thought they changed that. I thought they changed that to use notification center. Or maybe they gave you a choice. And the choice that I have, well, the choice that I just made is I'm quitting hardware growler. There, it there was giving me a notification saying that my iPhone was connecting and disconnecting with Bluetooth because they're having a party. Yeah. All right. Anyways. Anyway, you're going to so take us to Michael. Michael. Now? writes and says my 2012 macbook pro with a one terabyte samsung internal ssd is acting weird at startup specifically my magic mouse and trackpad are not responding and that the pointer shows up but i cannot click on anything i've done the following started up from my clone same behavior started in safe mode same issue disconnected all peripherals and started and ran apple hardware test on the first pass that showed an error on the second attempt showed none the error was um, yeah, some sort of four, uh, uh, four, four HDD one, one, four zeros. And I've gotten Got this it. as well. And I'll tell you more about that okay. in a moment. Yep. Uh, but it would, it, it, it indicated some sort of, uh, ATA or hard drive error. Oh, that's uh, bad. Possibly. Sure. Um, but this suggested a hard drive error or connection issue. But if this is the case, why no hardware error on the second run of hardware test? And why does the clone on a second drive have the same issue? Also, I remember you saying when an SSD dies, it dies in a spectacular fashion. I reset the PRAM and SMC, no dice again. I was able to put in my login password, ran disk utility, ran it, and it found no issues. Then out came the big guns. Disk Warrior. I started from the Disk Warrior USB stick. It didn't like the directory structure, so I rebuilt it. Still had the same issue after restart. Finally, I turned off my magic mouse and removed the batteries from my external trackpad, thinking it may be some sort of Bluetooth wackiness. That did it. I was thinking my drive was dead. Just goes to show you the easy solution may indeed be the solution. Now I need to find which Bluetooth drivers were messed up and nuke them. Okay. All right. 
I wanted to share this as a lesson to other listeners and some friendly advice. And even though I got caught, I didn't get caught in the end. All right. So thank you for sharing that story. The only thing I will share, Dave, is that at one point, so hardware test, eh, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't trust it. I'll tell you why I don't trust it. Because they have an article that I found that's archived, and it basically says, uh, yeah, if you get this error, ignore it. It's it's lying. Huh. Nice. Because I ran hardware test run time thinking I had a hardware issue, and I got this error, and I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's an ATA error, which is the you know bus for uh, you know communicating with many things. And I'm like, wow, that's not good. So just wanted to share that with him. So thank you for sharing, and thank me for sharing. So that's it. There's no issue. It's all it's all good. If we if we trust this uh, this this Apple article archived article, which I think in this case we probably should. Mm hmm. OK. All right. Well, there you go, then. So that's how it goes. All right. You want to take us to uh, Gary then, John? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Gary has an interesting one and we may need people's help on this one. OK. So Gary says, I recently switched all the security software on my devices to Kaspers Kaspersky. Kaspersky. Yeah. Kaspersky. Is that Russian? Sounds Russian. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, in the wake of the WannaCry disaster, their software is working great on all my devices, but for some reason on my iPhone 7 with iOS 10.3.2, when I do the initial setup, a window pops up with the following message. Device is jailbroken. Using Touch ID may be insecure on this device. I can assure you that none of my iOS devices are jailbroken. Why is this app giving a false warning? This is going to scare a lot of people. I recently restored my iPhone, Mac, and Apple Watch to do performance and other issues before the restoration. I got the same warning when I installed the app the first time. So I chucked it up to an unstable installation of iOS and possibly corrupted files, but I see this again on a fresh and clean device, and it's not funny. I agree. Uh, my expert analysis, Dave, yes. is it's a bug in their software. <laughs> huh. Right? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I don't know if they tested it necessarily with every release of iOS or um, or every piece of hardware. I mean, you should when you develop a software um, to test it out with as many combinations as is uh, reasonable. And we've seen what happens when that doesn't go right in that Apple releases an update and it bricks your device. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I have I have seen this with um, when you kind of when you move major operating systems or you actually when you run betas of, of any kind, I've seen some software say, whoa, th this must be uh, jailbroken because it's seeing something it's never seen before when in fact it's like, well, yeah, but it's it's normal. So, yeah, I guess if if. Your iOS, whatever app it is, hasn't been updated recently. It's possible if they're being really particular about stuff that you would get this this warning. But man, that's I mean, I guess I guess for something like Kaspersky, it's it's par for the course that they might be looking at a lot of different metrics. But but yeah, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think they're getting it wrong in this one. Yeah, because I mean, ten three two is fairly, you know, it came out what a couple of weeks ago, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they may have just yeah not and updated it, it. And if may, I mean, it's possible you've forgotten that you're on the public beta track or or a developer beta track, right? Because that stuff's really easy to do now. You just install the profile on your device, and then updates show up for you. And if you're not, you know, if you're just installing them or whatever, you might not even notice or remember that you're on the public, you know, or one of the beta tracks. So, uh, and, th and that's certainly possible that that would cause an issue with, uh, with software. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of the point. That's why they have these beta tracks. So developers can get their hands on this stuff and really make it work. So now the one thing I want to add, Dave, is that there is another piece of software that claims to tell you your, um, uh, jailbreak status on your iOS device. Yeah. Because I saw this recently, Dave, and it's our pal, and I'm loving it so far, um, My Amazing Mini. Oh. Has a little, uh, so right now, um, 
they have an info button next to your device. So it says a few things. So yeah. It's telling me iPhone 7, blah, blah, but then it has a little info button. There must be like a hundred pieces of data here. Uh, things that I didn't even know about <laughs> the phone. But one of them, you know, it tells you the, the processor, all sorts of things. But one flag it has is jailbroken. And for my phone, because I don't, I'm not into the jailbreak thing, it says no. So I'd be curious if he gets the same result because you can, um, yeah, you can get that software now or the, the latest beta. Maybe see if it also thinks there's it, it's jailbroken. I'd be curious. So yeah, iMazing Mini, we mentioned it briefly last week in the show it is freely available free forever uh backup software for your iphone but the or in your ipad any of your ios devices the cool part is that it's like time machine for your iphone it takes your existing backup and converts it to uh its own database for actually it's a an sql light or an sq light database format so it's a very common standard database but the beauty of that is is that once you have your backups in there, it can incrementally add to them and let you go back in time to uh, to extract a backup from any point you like. So and it'll do it wired or wirelessly and you can set what times of day it's going to back up and what the minimum battery level on your device should be, both your phone and your Mac. So mm -hmm. th this is really it, it's it's awesome and it's going to be free forever. There, there, there is no catch. In fact, what they told me uh, when I saw them this week at uh, in San Jose was, you know, their hope is that people will download iMazing Mini, like it, become interested in iMazing, which lets you manage more and other aspects of your iOS device. And of course, you buy it. So, uh, so great stuff. Pretty cool. Yeah. And yes, iCloud world. backups are able to run as well. It, it, they, they work in parallel. No, no problems there. Yeah, what rocked my world is the first time it did it, I got a notification and it said, yeah, I just completed a backup of your phone. The cool thing is that it did yeah. it over, as you point out, Wi-Fi. I'm like, dude, that's really neat. Yep. And the other thing it, it can do uh, is notify you if your battery falls below a certain level. It's it's done that for me as well. I said, I'm looking at my Mac and it's like, yeah, your phone's dying. You may want to get yep. it to a charger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It'll just tell you if you're sitting at your desk, hey, your, yeah, your phone's dying. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, while we're on the subject of great stuff and great companies, I do want to talk about our sponsor this week, which is Barebones uh, at Barebones or Barebones Software at Barebones.com. You know, uh, I mentioned it earlier. BB Edit is not only always top of mind for me, but is always running on my Mac. It's one of the first apps I put into my dock uh, because it does so many things like we were talking about before. You know, it'll compare files and it'll compare text files of any format and XML fits po totally fine there. And it's really cool because it'll show you not only the lines that are different, but then also you can navigate to the lines and it'll show you the text in the lines that's different. So very, very granular and just really easy to use. And that's the thing I like about BB Edit is it is this super like you can get uber geeky with it. Like crazy geeky, but you don't have to. And the things that are geeky aren't just like barfed at you when you first launch the software. It's actually a very clean interface. And then you start digging into the corners and the edges. It's like, oh, wait, all this stuff is here, but it's not in your way. You can just do what you need to do. And it's just a text editor. And and when I I don't mean to diminish the, the functionality of the software, but it's not a word processor is what I'm saying. It only edits text. So it's great for things like XML files. If you needed to edit a plist file, this is the right piece of software to do it with because it's going to show it to you. It's going to add a little bit of color uh, and filtering and formatting on the view, but it doesn't add any of that to the file, which is important. And the other part that's cool is it knows when the file's been changed on disk. So if you happen to have uh, an application like you're trying to troubleshoot something and you open up the plist file, you can watch it change before your very eyes as the app that's running manipulating it uh, is doing whatever it's doing. So you can start to see, ah, oh, OK, this is what the finder or mail or, you know, Skype or whatever it is. I've used it to troubleshoot all kinds of things. So really, really cool 
fun tool. I highly recommend it. And now, you know, they've got this great pricing structure where you get uh, the uh, sort of the, the basic features for free. And then you can, if you want some of the more advanced features, you can, you can add those. But I think everything we talked about in this ad here is free. So just go download it. Barebones.com. You can download BB Edit 11 from there. Our sincere thanks to the folks at Barebones for doing what you do and which includes sponsoring not only this episode, but this show for a long, long time. You folks rock. Thank you very much. All right, John. Uh, let's see. Where are we at here? I got to get us to. Oh, yeah. We have uh, we have another tip from from a mystery person, I believe. So I will find the tip, but it's it's not the tip isn't all, all that mysterious. It's just from a mystery person. In regards to Danny's text replacement problem in the most recent show, here is the fix. This is how you get it to resync your text replacements, at least according to whomever this little birdie is. Uh, you must turn off the predictive text tab and iCloud Drive first, then reboot your phone, then turn to predictive text back and, and iCloud Drive back on. So go to settings, then general, then keyboards, then turn off predictive text. If you do not see the predictive text tab or just the word predictive, it may be because you have installed some kind of third-party keyboard. Uh, remove any third-party keyboard because you can always add them back after things are back to normal and syncing. Then you must also turn off iCloud Drive in settings under iCloud, which now is at the top, kind of under your, your account name. Now reboot your phone and turn uh, predictive text and iCloud back on in those same places. Give it a few seconds for everything to sync up and it should work. Uh, this person says, guess what? I had the same problem this week where both my 17 inch and my 13 inch MacBooks pro would sync together, but not with my phone. But one of my friends had asked me if I had any third party keyboards installed because I couldn't find the predictive text tab. So I said, yes, I did this and uninstalled them and everything worked. So thank you so much for that. That's, uh, it's that, that predictive text thing. That's, that makes sense because it's using all of that stuff too. The predictive text definitely feeds off of, in part, your text substitution stuff. So I can see where th having that turned on might get in the way of, of syncing happening if something's not quite right. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Good, good stuff. Any thoughts on that before we move on here, John? Moving on. All right. So for those of you that have been following the thread about building a new home and or doing expansions. It is that time of year. And uh, in show 657, we talked about some hints. Mike says, I'm just listening to show 657. Uh, and you gave all great advice about what type of wiring to add to a home. But I'd like to add one thing. Don't forget to run cat five coax and even fiber from wherever that central location is that you wire everything in your house to. And run Cat5 coax and, and perhaps fiber to an outside drop to wherever these services are going to come into your house. Or even better, add conduit there with string in it so you can run any sort of thing you want. He says, I work as an installer of fiber optic services and we are constantly going to brand new houses where we need to drill through the wall and run ugly visible wires. Often we get sent away for this very reason. And... Uh, my dad's actually uh, in the process of building a house now. And I, I called him as soon as Mike's email came in. I'm like, oh, dad, you got to know. And he said, you know what? Um, the builders said that as a default feature of, of the house, you know, in this neighborhood or development or whatever it is, uh, they do. They run conduit from the the drop point on the house down to the basement where, you know, where you would want to have this stuff. So uh, so there you go. Good, good advice, Mike. Thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, I can, it would, it would suck to do all that work, wire every room, everything's great, put up the walls, uh, put up the siding and then have to drill through it because you didn't think about getting inside to outside. So crazy stuff. All right. And then, um, we have a comment from listen, an audio comment from listener, Andrew. He uses the product tune in here, but that's, that's actually unrelated. This is about the, any apps. I think we had a listener with the MLB app and perhaps something else that was auto rewinding 
uh, seemingly mysteriously. And so Andrew ran into this too and found the reason and perhaps the solution. And good day, John, and good day, Dave. It's Andrew here in Bellingen in Australia, somewhere between Sydney and Brisbane. Hey, just responding to one of the listeners who got caught the other week with Tune In and how it plays along, then rewinds after about five minutes to about by about one minute, then it plays for another five, then rewinds for one. I had a similar experience, and what I found was that was occurring when the um, iPhone with TuneIn was jumping on and off uh, 3G or 4G and my home Wi-Fi. So if I were to drive home and come onto my home Wi-Fi system after being on 3G or 4G, it would kind of freak out a little bit and say, what network am I on? I can't work this out. I need to re-authenticate. So let me rewind for one minute and then play and catch up again. So maybe um, your listener has a problem uh, with the iPhone jumping on and off his home or work or wherever Wi-Fi system uh, and 4G, or it could just be a, a natural thing or a weak 3G, 4G signal or a weak Wi-Fi signal or something like that. Anyway, that should uh, help him out and others out like me who have suffered this problem before. And I think the only advice is to uh, get over it. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Or, you know, turn off the auto join new Wi-Fi networks or something. Uh, I notice when uh, I mean, I don't notice it when I'm driving because I, I really am pretty good and, and don't look at my phone while I'm driving. But I, I certainly notice when I'm in a car as a passenger, if I'm messing around on my phone, uh, there are spots where, you know, I'll stop at a stoplight, especially in a downtown area or some, you know, the car will be stopped at a spot stoplight. And I'll notice my phone thinking it has joined you know, some Wi-Fi network, you know, cause somebody has got their Xfinity network and it's a business or, or even a house close to the street. It's close enough to, to broadcast that into the car. But then of course, as the car takes off and is now, you know, moving it at, at whatever 30 miles an hour away from the, the house, it, the phone takes a while to give up on that Wi-Fi signal, especially if it has an active network connection in progress. So, um, so yeah, perhaps just turning off Wi-Fi when you drive or, uh, you know, the folks at Apple say that that whole decision about which network to use is is based on a lot of predictive stuff. Uh, so, yeah, it might not be so simple. But anyway, there you go. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to predict that I have something to add here, Dave. Predict away, my friend. <laughs> so, um, so I'm with Optimum. Okay. And uh, like many um, internet providers, they uh, they may offer Wi-Fi service in your area as well. And they absolutely do that uh, in my area. But I found something new and exciting, Dave. Um, so I started noticing, so, so the uh, what they're called now is, uh, I think it's Optimum Wi-Fi. Duh. All right. So I have that set up on my list of things to connect to when I'm out and about. Um, but it's open. It's not encrypted. Uh, so, you know, probably want to use a VPN to, uh, take care of that because people could potentially see my traffic. But then I noticed that there is another one in the neighborhood alongside it called optimum online underscore pass point. And it has a little lock next next to it. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And all of a sudden I got an email from optimum and they're like, Hey, check this out. We offer, we got something new for you. It's basically WPA2 Enterprise. Right. So this is the what Comcast has been doing for a while, right? Where you get a profile from them that that uses your, or do you just use your normal uh, opt online so, login and password? Yeah. So it's a little different. So what you do, uh, so one, you got to register the MAC address of your device with them. Yep. Which I had already done, and that allowed me to log in, you know, automatically if if the device, rather than asking for credentials, it'll just let you in. Um. But then it'll prompt you now. So this is the additional security. But now, uh, being WPA2 Enterprise, it prompts me for my username and password for my Optimum account. But not only does it do that, and then I guess it stores that information away, but not only does it do that, it then presents you, it says, hey, here's a certificate from the guys you're connecting to. Um, do you trust them? And you do one-time authorization, and then everything's cool. So what that cert is, it's, it's not a, 
it's not just a cert, it's a profile, right? Uh, most likely. And then that profile includes the information for how to connect to that network. Uh, I don't see an additional profile. So oh. I think they're doing it in a different way. Okay. But you have to say, yes, I trust the certificate. And then you don't get prompted again. Yeah. Right. So it's, right. it's one, uh, I think it's a different way of deploying WPA2 Enterprise. It is. Yeah. The, uh, Again, this is what the, Comcast does this. They don't tell you what credentials they're putting in the, the profile that you get. But those credentials, as pointed out by a very astute Mac Keycab listener, are exactly what you're describing here. It's just your Xfinity login and password. So you don't the, the, the problem with the Comcast profile is it has the uh, the secure one, the WPA2 Enterprise. And really, the only difference it, it, from a user standpoint between WPA2 Personal and WPA2 Enterprise is that Enterprise has username and password and WPA2 Personal just has password um, in terms of what you have to enter as a user. So single password for everybody in the house, WPA2 Personal. Different passwords for each user alongside a username, WPA2 Enterprise. Um, but with the Comcast one, it also includes their insecure Xfinity profile that, that for whatever reason, tends not to work all that well. So in general, sometimes it does. Now, so. here's the part that didn't work right, Dave. So I, that's now in my, uh, you know, my keychain as uh, an access point to connect to. And so I you know, uh, moved it up in the priority list, um, even though I shouldn't need to, because as you said, there are these rules. And yeah. if you're deciding between a secure or encrypted connection and an open one, iOS claims it will choose the more secure one. Well, it didn't. Yeah. Every time I was out and about, it kept choosing opt online instead of opt online underscore passpoint. So I eventually just deleted opt online because the thing is anywhere that there's opt online, there is now. So they fully deployed it. They fully deploy. Um, okay, there you go. Oh, but it was annoying good. that they didn't appear to be following their rules in Apple didn't determining appear, which appear Wi-Fi to be they following the rules, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's a nice option to yeah. know that I'm uh, protected when I'm out. Well, there. thanks for that story, John. It's good. All right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna jump to James here, and James has a question that I think will lead us uh, down a, a little path. He says, "I plan to purchase a new iMac and will be probably using it for a long time. I am almost certainly going to get the 27 inch iMac because it has replaceable RAM. Currently, I have a late 2009 27 inch iMac in which I have replaced the optical drive with a 500 gig SSD, giving me two drives." 500 gig SSD and the one terabyte spindle drive that was original. Since I plan to use the new computer for a long time, I want, and I want the best performance. I think I want to purchase a computer with an SSD drive. I would assume the SSD has a much longer life expectancy than a regular rotational drive or fusion drive. But the problem of course, is that Apple makes their SSDs so expensive. So I would probably be limited to a 500. The 500 gig SSD is $200 extra to increase to the one terabyte is Four hundred dollars more. Uh, that seems like a lot for an extra five hundred gigs. So the problem is storage. I assume that I could get excellent performance from external drives hooked up through Thunderbolt. Uh, I wish that Apple offered the possibility of two internal drives, but I guess Thunderbolt is the alternative. And of course, they're charging a lot for RAM: sixteen gigs for an extra two hundred and thirty-two gig and an extra six hundred. I, it appears RAM is going to be easy to replace in the new twenty-seven. Uh, if so, I will get eight gigs and then do the upgrade myself. But before I do any of this, I wanted to check with you. So if you have any suggestions or corrections, please let me know. Um, so here's the thing, uh, you know, and we're this is all developing, but the SSD is likely, you know, replaceable. And I'll use air quotes for the, for that uh, in the new IMAX, but also with air quotes, not easily. Um, I fix it has a guide to these things and it details the, the 5K IMAX uh, replacement instructions and it looks pretty awful. I'm going to assume that the new iMacs are basically the same uh, form factor, at least in terms of in terms of that. So, yeah, I, I would say uh, you don't want to plan to replace the SSD in this thing. The good news, though, is that this iMac supports USB three. And of course, as you pointed out, uh, Thunderbolt three. Um, 
And being that it's not a portable machine, using an external drive really isn't a burden at all. It's not like you have to, you know, plug and unplug as you move the thing around. Um, and to me, that opens up your options. So depending on how you want to do it, you could get the least expensive fusion drive inside the computer from Apple and then just immediately add something like, a, you know, an OWC Mercury Elite Pro, which is four or uh, the Elite Pro Mini, which is 450 bucks for a one terabyte uh, SSD. So it, but it might actually be cheaper initially to do the internal Apple drive because you're able to, you know, quote unquote, trade the value of the fusion drive towards that SSD. Um, but then of course you're trading away that storage as well. So, uh, so, you know, consider that because you certainly can run your Mac off of an externally booted startup drive. There's nothing wrong with that, especially with, you know, with an iMac that's not moving around, I would I would be very cautious to recommend that for someone using a MacBook Pro or any kind of laptop where, you know, where you, you're not always going to be in a scenario where it's easy to plug in the external drive. But man, with a desktop machine, who cares? It's just right there. So. Um, so anyway, that's. That's my thoughts on that. And, it, and as far as the RAM, upgrade it yourself. Uh, that seems like the right idea at this point, because that's really, really straightforward to do. So thoughts, John? I like that we're at the point where, so the internal bus, last I checked, SATA 3 is 6 gigabits per second, right? Yeah. Yep. But the cool thing is that the external ports, so USB 3, I think, in theory, is what, 5 gigabits per second? That's correct. Yep. But then Thunderbolt is, what, 20 now? Or yeah. 40, I'm sorry. Oh, Those yeah, yeah, 40? right, right. Uh, yeah, what is the speed of Thunderbolt 3? You're, I think you're right, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's nice because that wasn't always the case with a lot of their machines in that hooking things up externally, you would almost always take a performance hit. Now that's not the case. So No. So, I mean, buy as much as you can <laughs> for the internal. Um, but if you need to expand further on, and like you said, yeah, I... I don't really like using an external relying on an external drive on a, on a portable. Right. Right. I mean, it's great for backups or, you know, specific use case type stuff, but you don't want it to be your boot drive, but on an iMac, I, I mean, you're probably not going to notice a difference once you get it all, you know, hooked up and configured. It's just going to do it. And yes, John, it is uh it is 40 gigabits per second on Thunderbolt three. So there you go. And, uh, Speaking of fast ports, Dave. Yeah. Um, I I do believe that uh, a machine that they just announced now has a 10 gigabit Ethernet. Port, yeah. So that new right? iMac Pro, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. that looks. Oh, I was drooling. I mean, I think it's five thousand bucks starting. But. Yeah. You're if you're going to buy an iMac Pro, you're oh. not going to spend five grand. You're going to spend more than that, I would think. Um, well, I think that was the base price. That's right. For like the yeah. very. Basic, but the specs for that thing? Yeah, it's wow. crazy. In addition, I mean, that caught my eye. I'm like, oh, 10 gigabit, because you can get that now. Yeah. But it's not something that's really in consume. Well, that's not a consumer. It's not a consumer thing. Machine. Right. Yeah. You're <laughs> going to want to be able to move data around, uh, you know, to your, your NAS drive or whatever. So, yeah. Um, but it, you, the uh, that space gray, uh, you know, on the iMac itself, it, it's fine. That keyboard and mouse, though. And, and trackpad, right? Space Gray looks awesome. That was the thing that caught, seemed to catch everybody's eye. And uh, later in the week, I was speaking with uh, another little birdie, and I don't know what company they work for, but uh, they were we were talking about how great that looked. And I was informed that, uh, at least in this person's belief, that that keyboard was a one-off mock-up. It was a keyboard and it worked. I mean, people were typing on it, but that is not what the production keyboard is going to look like. And the reason that you, they did this, you know, sort of one off mock up keyboard uh, was so that they could show space gray without showing the touch bar on the keyboard. So that would be very interesting if uh, if we finally see an external keyboard with a touch bar, because now effectively that becomes an iOS device connected to your Mac, right? I mean, that's what a, the touch bar effectively is, you know, a programmable thing. So very, very interesting. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops. I think Apple will need to uh, announce 
the specs and pricing of the Mac Pro before they put that iMac Pro on sale. Because if they don't, I don't think anybody's going to buy the iMac Pro knowing that, you know, this Mac Pro is is around the corner. So I, I think and I, I mean, I, I'm sure Apple knows this and, and they've, they've got their plans in place to kind of show people what that Mac Pro is going to be before that iMac Pro is uh, is available. But it's pretty cool. Fun stuff. Um, anything else from the keynote? grab your attention mr braun there or or not just the keynote but any announcements last week i oh, um, that one i mean th this uh yeah and that you know and then some people you know we're having a little debate oh well you got the imac pro uh you know does that mean that they're going to move forward with the mac pro and the thing is yeah they are there's so, no um, debate apple has said it um, yeah, and I saw you, uh, you know, I was being snarky and I'm like, well, you know, that, that that's the end of the Mac Pro. <laughs> right. No, it, right in the iMac Pro product They're, they're going to do it, but yeah. now it's going to be a challenge. Well, they, they got time. This is coming yeah. in December, right? So they have right. time to differentiate the two. Um, yep. But man, I mean, you know, the specs of that thing, I mean, I, I, well, I suppose there are people that will need more juice than this, but this, this has plenty. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, even the, I mean, even the, the 27 inch iMac now, uh, you know, the 5k one, it rocks it's killer so there's a there's a lot of power out there all right so yeah. new imax aside any uh anything else from the keynote that that caught your or the announcements last week that caught your eye uh i mean in general you know ios uh it looks like they're adding more features to make it more make one more productive to make it a better replacement for a computer yeah uh, was was my impression have um, you have you installed the beta on anything yet uh, yeah, no okay so i have it <laughs> i have it on my uh iphone i brought my spare iphone you know we always keep a spare iphone in the hamilton household and generally travel with it um so that one right now is the se from last year and i brought that with me and installed the ios 11 on it while i was out there and then when i got home i installed ios 11 uh on my sort of my main ipad mini which is the ipad mini 4 or that which is my main ipad i'm a mini kind of person and so we'll, we'll, another time we'll have a conversation about how i'm sad that i'm gonna have to go to a bigger ipad at some point but uh but because it doesn't seem like apple's gonna update these minis but um yeah it's interesting that the ipad the new ipad features are amazingly stable it, it's obvious that this is not you know, this is not where things generally are in uh, in the beta process. It's usually really flaky. And there are parts of the OS that are flaky to be expected. But the new stuff for the iPad is not. And again, I was told last week that this stuff, all, like the new control center and kind of the way that all works and that whole paradigm uh, was all supposed to roll out last year. They just couldn't get it finished in time. So this has been in development for for if if I'm. Uh, if my sources are correct, th this has been in development for a long time. Uh, it's not just for iOS 11. It's just like, well, we couldn't get it for iOS, you know, 10.3, like, like they did with 9.3. Right. So it's like, all right, we'll make iOS 11. You know, the iPad will be a first class citizen with the, with the initial release on that, which is, which is a good thing. I think it's great. Um, but it's interesting. So a couple of tips for those of you that are running the beta or are going to be running the beta. Um, if you want to quit apps on the iPad, it's very different now. You know, you used to double tap the home button and you would bring up the uh, app switcher, which let you swipe apps up to uh, to shut them off or to, you know, to quit them. And that doesn't work anymore because it just brings up basically the control center. Uh, not even basically, it does bring up the control center. Uh, the way you do it is you hold down on one of your apps and then just like it's like you, you getting into jiggly jiggly mode in Springboard, uh, which is the front screen of the iPhone, iPhone and iPad, where you'd move apps around or remove them. You do the same thing here. They don't jiggle jiggle, but uh, but the function is the same. You get the little X in the corner. So so there's that. And John, I found a new feature. One that I've been looking for for a long time in iOS 11. If you go to settings and general uh, and scroll all the way to the bottom, 
There's reset, which then brings up mm-hmm. the sub menu of all those things. But there's another thing right below reset, John. Shutdown. So if you want to turn off your iPhone, which is really handy at times for troubleshooting, uh, you don't have to f- like you know force it off. You can you can do it this way, which I thought was really interesting that they added this. You don't have to hold the button or do any of that crazy other stuff. It's just right there. Good to go. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the Mac. Kind of like the Mac. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I did like, so they, they also in iOS 11 uh, announced uh, some features that would make it less likely for you to be distracted by your shiny toy while you're operating a motor vehicle. Yeah. 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 I can I, tell you, there, I, I have seen so many occurrences. I mean, the only time that, it, you know, is when I use Waze, which I know you know, used to terrify you, but I've gotten better. <laughs> yeah. But I see so many, I see so many times just going around town, people crossing the yellow line invariably when I get closer to them or they get closer to me, they're screwing around with their phone. Yeah, so Stop I, it. I have a theory, not a theory. I've done a lot of thinking about this and you know, I, I, I'm with, I'm totally with you that, I mean, it's, it's not a debate. It's been proven that, the phone, any kind of screen like that, uh, it's a very immersive device. And that level of distraction is is really bad when you're operating a motor vehicle. But here's the thing. And I'm not excusing that behavior at all. But, you know, we are so early on in the adoption of or the inclusion, the integration of these types of devices into our lives that we're still kind of figuring out as a society how to do this stuff. And, and we're all really impatient people. And of course, you know, I'm the poster child for being impatient and, and we want these changes to happen immediately. Like we want people to understand like, dude, don't, you know, use your, don't lift up your phone in a movie theater because it lights up your face and it's awful. But you know, I still see people do it. And even at the talk show the other night, I had uh, people who shall remain nameless on either side of me. The show started and they're like, you know, dicking around on Instagram or whatever with their phone brightness at like full tilt. It's like, you know, that's like, that's kind of not a cool thing to do. Like if you're going to do that, think about that. Lower your brightness. If you're going to be taking pictures at an event, um, first of all, turn down your brightness so that the people behind you don't have to be shined in the face and turn off your flash. If you're at an event like that, because chances are the stage lights are much better at lighting the stage than your phone is ever going to be. But, you know, these are just a couple of examples of the things that we as a society need to adopt. And I rewind back to when we had cars for the first time, right now, We have all these not just accepted norms, but literally laws and rules about what it is you do with the car and how you operate it. And you need to be licensed now to use a car. That wasn't always the case. Right. And so think about think about something as simple as the four way stop. Right. It's a it's a it's a brilliant construct. Everybody has to understand how it works. And once everybody does understand how it works, you don't need any additional help. There's no traffic lights. There's nothing. There's no external forces. Everybody just understands the rules, shows up at a four way stop. And for the most part, everybody does. I mean, there's still the morons out there that don't. But, you know, you get to a four way stop. Everybody sort of works it and gets to where they need to go without just, you know, plowing their cars into each other. But that didn't come quickly. I'm certain the four way stop was this thing that had to be very thoughtfully and intentionally developed and is likely the result of a lot of problems. Here's the thing. I don't think we're even close to being at the four way stop point of our inclusion of smartphones into our lives. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Like we're just not even there yet, let alone much further down the road where we've actually got rules and laws. And I mean, Mm -hmm. we do have some laws in the texting or, you know, operating a phone, depending on what state you're in while driving is, is, uh, is illegal. But um, yeah, it's just, it it's, you know, we've got it. Let me put it this way. 10 years ago to this day, 10 years ago, you could not buy an iPhone yet. 
it was close, right? I mean, I think we're just a couple of weeks away from, uh, from that, but you couldn't buy an iPhone. So, and iPhones, I mean, yes, we had like trios and stuff before that, but uh, you know, those things weren't all that immersive. <laughs> they were functional. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really I'm think with you. we're going to have to yeah. learn it because even the four way stop thing, last I checked, the basic rule is the first one that gets there is the first one that can then proceed. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, that's how it works. Now, if people get there at the same time, then there's some nuances. But I still see people that don't get it right. And some even shake their fist or blow their horn at me. And I'm like, no, I was here first. Right. Take your turn. Take right. your turn. And in this chat room, as Kiwi Graham says, in and I'm just reading, I'm not agreeing. I'm just quoting. In the developed world, four-way stop has progressed to becoming a roundabout. We have a lot of those roundabouts here in New England. Um, oh, yeah. And... People, the, the, the two lane roundabout is something that absolutely blows people's minds. It's a, it is a pretty advanced thing, the two lane roundabout, but it's not that difficult. You just have to be, again, be intentional and learn it and, and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Remember that time we got creamed by that guy in the roundabout? I do. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Again, he didn't understand the rules. I'm but the funny you, part was he, I'm right. <laughs> he came from Germany, that guy. So if anybody and this was what, 15, 20 years ago, more than. Yeah, it was 20 years ago because I didn't have children. Um, the uh, you know, you would think that uh, that that some someone from Europe where they have far more roundabouts than we even do here in New England would uh, would have understood. But anyway, well. The thing is, I, I'd be curious how much experience they had driving because the yeah. higher the reflection when I was in Germany is Germany has a way superior public transportation system compared to uh, most of this country. So they may not have been behind the wheel for a while. There you go. And, well, it kind of showed, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it sure did. <laughs> All right. So anything else? I am running High Sierra on my MacBook Air. Now, my MacBook Air is long in the tooth. At least in terms of of MacBook Airs, it's it's a 2011 11 inch MacBook Air, and Sierra had it had gotten to the point with Sierra where it's very difficult for this thing to function uh, because of all the background tasks that Sierra wants to fire off all the time: contact agent and calendar agent and an MD worker. I mean, which and I know what all these things do, but it seems to want to fire them off when I want to use my processor, and it's like, no, nah, it's cool. We'll use 100 percent of the CPU. No, no worries. Um, my, and I've only been using it for, you know, a, a few days, but it seems like that might have gotten a little better with high Sierra. I, it's too soon to tell. And obviously it's a beta, but, um, but you know, it does run on it and it, at worst, it runs exactly the way Sierra does it so far. It seems to be running better than Sierra. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to high Sierra as a, uh, as our as our future here, so hi. Yeah, I thought they were joking when they announced the name. I thought it was another joke, and then they were going to actually tell us oh, the they, name. Uh, yeah, and a lot of people ran with the uh, with the uh, allusion to uh, uh, a certain uh, substance. Oh, well, so did I mean, so did Apple, yeah. right? I mean, they, what did Federe say? He said this one is uh, is this uh, this operating system is fully baked. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> But it looks to me, for the most part, it's uh, one of these underneath the covers yeah. improvement releases. There's no major user features. I mean, some like some, I saw, like I think yeah. one thing I saw is so it sounds like they've redesigned photos to not do unnecessary work, <sighs> as I think you and I have shaken our fist at. Right. To a degree. So, right. They, they do. They, they centralize more of the like I think one thing I noted, like more you know, of the metadata recognition. Yeah, more but, the, yeah, more of the, the stuff that should be centralized. But for, it's not all done that way. So if again, yeah. and I did you watch Gruber's talk show this week? No. OK, so no, to, uh, if you are someone who watches the keynote there, you, you must then watch Gruber's talk show. Like there's just no there's no two ways about it because it is keynote part two. Um, and Federighi went into this a little bit. He said that the uh, what they sync with photos is only the things where you have said like it like let's say I have a picture of you right uh, and I and my Mac asks me you know identify this person or is this John yes that's John so it syncs that but what it doesn't sync is the fact that that Mac then went and and intuited and figured out 
that all of these other pictures of this person that it believes to be the same are also John. So all that work is still going to have to happen on each of my Macs, as opposed to letting one of them do that work and sync it around. And their excuse, uh, and I will call it that, is that, well, we, you know, we've intuited this data, so we don't want to sync that around. It's like, well, why not? Because if I correct it on one device, the, the work should only be done once. And if it's wrong, well, that's okay in that it can be corrected and then and then that gets synced. So I, I really I, I think it's stupid, to be perfectly honest, that they're not doing all of this work in the cloud. I get the, the secure that Apple is concerned about security. That's great. But this has nothing to do with that because your photos are literally available to anyone who can log in as you on the Web. If you're if they're in iCloud photo library. So security, th this is not the concern. Right. This is just Apple not moving enough to the cloud, in my opinion. And I'm certain I'm right about that. So there you go. <laughs> but yes, at least they're doing some of this. And, and maybe in typical Apple fashion, we'll see them inch down this road slowly because that's that is there is a history of them doing that. I don't know. That's my feeling. I got to see the HomePod, John. I didn't get to hear it. I got to see it though. I'm curious to see where that product goes. Very interesting. The home part. Yeah. Yet another yes. thing that you talk to, right? It is another thing that you talk to. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, and yeah. It does stuff for you. <laughs> well, it plays music for you. That That's what it does. It does not. Um, for now. Right. Right. That's correct. Well, it doesn't do anything for now because it's not available yet. But but what's been announced is that it plays music um, very specifically. And I asked them about this. It It is not currently built to uh, or marketed as something that will play your audio from your shows on your Apple TV. Um, and that. I'm not convinced it will ever get there. And I'll, I'll tell you why the HomePod uh, has no input other than power. So the only way it gets data is Wi-Fi. There is no Ethernet and there is no, you know, optical or HDMI pass through or anything like that. So that it's very difficult to do video and audio syncing anyway right i mean especially on two separate devices like that's just not a simple thing it becomes much more difficult when you're trying to do video and audio syncing over wireless especially over a shared wireless network which assuming i'm assuming is what this will use so uh, you know be and the shared wireless network just being the one in your home although it's possible that the, you know like your apple tv and your home pod could build an ad hoc network between the two of them that, that eliminates a lot of the, the questions, but um, yeah, I, I don't see that particular device being great at playing TV audio and Apple has, has not said that it will, uh, but it seems very odd to me that they would come out with this thing that's, that's really built for the living room and, uh, and only make it a music player. So interesting. Um, and, and Andy in the, uh, in the chat room says it's still just mono though. That's not entirely true. The, there's two things. Number one, you can pair two home pods together to truly have a stereo field, but even with just one, it's got seven tweeters around the base of the thing aiming outward. And what they do with that is reflect sound off your walls to give you that wider stereo field. Similar to what Sonos is doing with both the Play 5, the new Play 5, and the Play Bar and Play Bass. So uh, I, I think from, from what I've uh, – some people did get to hear it. Uh, and from what they've said, it does do uh, a job. I, and it seemed like a respectable job, but it certainly does a job of creating that stereo field. So, So there you go. Yeah. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm frankly, you, I mean, you all know I'm a huge Sonos fan. Um, I'm glad to see Apple entering this market because 
uh, thus far, no one has really been able to compete with Sonos in terms of providing an easy to use music player that's that's truly a streaming music player uh, in the home. And so I'm happy to see uh, someone, especially Apple, uh, stepping into this market. So I, I think that'll be really good for all of us that, that care about this kind of stuff. So anyway, there you go. Anything else while we're on this topic, John? No. Okay. All right. Uh, we've got a little bit of time here. A little bit of time. Um, let's let's talk to Bobby because this is this is one of those interesting things, and it might get a little geeky. And I kind of like this. Uh, Bobby says, "Dave and John, I know the two of you have a lot going on, uh, but I need to ask a question." I'm the mobile device specialist at a law firm uh, with uh, almost 200 attorneys to whom we provide an iPhone uh, for each of them. Every 18 months, uh, I upgrade every iPhone. And as you can imagine, when we use the 16 gig iPhones, backing up and restoring that many iPhones using iCloud was manageable and didn't put too much of a burden on our corporate wireless network. Now, with us purchasing 64 and 128 gig iPhones, the backup and restore of these many iPhones over our corporate wireless network is starting to put a strain on it. When I have my process going, I can kick out about seven iPhone upgrades in one day. I'm now looking for a method to backup and restore five iPhones to a local computer, a Mac, at one time, saving our corporate wireless network from the strain. In a perfect world, I would like to find a method of connecting three or four iPhones to a Mac, processing the backup and restore. Would either of you have a method that would allow me to get the job done on a local computer? I hope my question makes sense. And I don't think what I'm looking for is uh, possible, but I just want to run it by the two of you to make sure I'm not crazy. So, yeah, this is a great question. Uh, and there's a couple of ways. The first one that comes to mind that we talked about earlier in this episode is iMazing Mini. Uh, you can let that do your backups and your restores. Uh, you'd probably want to add iMazing to the mix just to give you a better user interface for doing that. But it can do multiple devices simultaneously over USB. So you could plug these devices in via USB and do all of your backups that way and restores that way. And you wouldn't have to mess with your wireless network. But if you wanted to restore from iCloud, because that's where the backups already exist, uh, you could still do this. It would have to be over Ethernet. And yes, your iOS devices all will support Ethernet now. Uh, it's a little tricky getting there. Uh, you need a lightning to USB adapter and uh, a an Ethernet to USB adapter. And then you either need a powered USB hub or some sort of power to, to make all that work right. But... Um, but that would preserve your iCloud centric workflow without having to use your wireless network. And there's a um, there's a uh, there's a great article that describes this whole thing that we'll we'll put a link to in the show notes. But uh, use it either with an Ethernet switch uh, or a powered USB hub or something like that to to make it work. But you know, one added benefit of doing setup over Ethernet is that you don't have to manually sign the device into your wireless network. Uh, and you can let that be configured with either your backup or store, or if you're using mobile device management, now you can send your profiles to these devices uh, over Ethernet, and you still don't have to worry about um, MDM, uh, uh, you know, manually typing in the Wi-Fi credentials. Not that that's a big burden or anything, but... Um, but it, you know, there you go. Oh, and uh, well, actually, I have something to add. But but, John, do you have any that, that's tangentially related? But do you have anything related to this question to add, John? I was scratching my head over this. Now, the one problem is I only have one iOS device currently. Right. Well, actually, that's a lie because yeah. I actually did try. Well, I have an Apple TV, which oh, right. can. OK. And I did try to plug that and my iPhone into one computer and to see if it would see both of them. And it did. Sure. Of course. What I was thinking was for, well, except, so the Apple TV has a USB port, but um, but all the devices that, that we would like to manage here have lightning. Does anybody make, or does it even make sense to, to think about something called a lightning, I'll call it a lightning hub. Does anybody make such a thing? Like a big rack that you can put, I, I thought someone made it maybe for a prior interface, but I thought there were companies that did this. 
You see where I'm going? Yeah, they just connect just connect lightning directly to a USB hub yeah, or something like, like that. Or it's a it, it's a lightning hub, which you could then. I've only seen maybe. that for charging. I haven't seen it for uh, for anything okay. else. But but I mean, you've got lightning to USB, so you can go. I mean, you could put you right. could just lightning to USB to all of your Macs, and and then this would work fine. I again, I amazing. I think is going to be better than iTunes in terms of being mm-hmm. able to to back up and restore multiple devices simultaneously. Um, but lightning to USB would do it. Yeah. Now a cool thing, John. So I mentioned that I put uh, iOS 11 on my, my sort of production iPad, the one that I use every day and it worked fine. It was working great. Loved it. Uh, and then I decided to restart it and it got stuck on the Apple logo and there was no going past that. So I had to do a restore and, uh, and I did the, I was going to do the iCloud restore, but as the thing came up, it asked me, as it does, uh, you know, do you want to log into your wireless network manually or do you want to get the credentials from another iOS 11 device? And I thought, oh, I have my iPhone SE. That's an iOS 11 device. So it said, just bring it close to it. And I did. And the iPhone SE lit up and said, do you want to pass your you know, Wi-Fi credentials over to, to your iPad mini Four? And I said, yes. And then it had, it was just like the pairing of the Apple watch. It had like this, you know, starry thing on the screen and it said, okay, grab your, your iPad, which had the camera lit up already and, uh, and hold that over and center this, you know, moving starry thing in the, in the circle again, exactly like the Apple watch. And as soon as it paired the two devices, they shared credentials and everything, uh, everything worked, which was pretty cool. I think it's smart that Apple's doing that. So, so there you go. That's the uh, it's cool stuff that Apple's doing. I like it. But I think that's it, John. That's all we got time for today. Uh, it, I mean, you know, in terms of time. I do want to thank every one of our Mac Geek App Premium contributors for this week. If you're interested in becoming a Mac Geek App Premium contributor, you can visit macgeekapp.com slash premium or macobserver.com slash shop. And, uh, and you can learn all about it there. You get access to our premium at MacGeekUp.com email address and some other fun stuff, which we'll have some news about soon. But uh, I want to thank everybody that has contributed this week. So Harvey S. Yes, did a one-time contribution of five bucks. Uh, on the monthly contributions of ten, we have new uh, contributor, K- Ch- sorry, Shannon K. to thank. Also, Martin T., thank you. W. Abdullah B., Thank you. Barry F. Thank you. Doug L. Thank you. Michael B. Thank you. Mark R. Thank you. James B. Thank you. Ari L. Thank you. John G. Thank you. Paul M. Thank you. And on our biannual plan at 25 bucks, we have John P. Thank you. David T. Thank you. Tony S. Thank you. Dan G. And thank you. Frank F. Thank you. Chris M. Thank you. Michael M., thank you. Hamad A., thank you. Larry S., thank you. And Jim L., thank you as well. You all rock, all of you. Everybody that listens rocks. We really appreciate it, whether you're a premium subscriber or not. We appreciate you listening, sending in questions and tips and all of that stuff. It's really, really cool. And uh, you all rock. I mean, it really, we, we couldn't do this without you, and I mean that in every sense of the word. So everything that you can do to, uh, to make this show what it is and, uh, and all of that is, is so appreciated. So thank you, thank you. All right. What else do we have, John? We told them how to contact us. Find us on Facebook. Visit uh, MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook to... to uh, to join our, our Mac Geek Cab group over there where you can get questions answered and we can just chat with each other during the week when we're not here doing the recordings. I also want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Of course, I want to thank all of our WWDC coverage sponsors, which is GigSky, iMazing, Otherworld Computing, SaneBox, Riedel. Of course, our sponsor for this episode, Barebone Software. Our ongoing podcast marketplace sponsors of Smile and Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. Yeah, that's what I like to say. But John, what do you like to say? I'd like to say many things. 
But at this specific point in time, Dave, the thing that I would like to say and share and encourage you all to do is to not get caught. Made up.